You also find uh, John McManus's uh, booklet on the table on the United Nations, and if you want to get an autographed copy of it, this is the time to do it. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to sign it. But our speaker, he was born in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and is an experienced public speaker and a distinguished member of the National Council of the John Birch Society. He received his BS in physics from Holy, Holy Cross, served three years as a Marine Corps officer, began a career as an electronic engineer in 1960, and joined the John Birch Society in 1964. In 1966, he left the engineering profession to accept a full-time position with the Society. Appointed the Society's Public Relations Director in 1973, he became the organization's official spokesman with the major media. His effectiveness as a defender of the U.S. Constitution and national independence has been well received numerous times on C-SPAN network via, via interviews conducted by Pat Buchanan, Larry King, and many other radio and television hosts. His dedicated service led to his 1991 appointment as president of the John Birch Society. Not only a heavy sought after speaker, he is also the author of five books and countless pamphlets and magazine articles. One of his latest books, as was mentioned on William Buckley, Pied Piper from the Establishment, explains why the liberals and internationalists have long considered Mr. Buckley their ally, not their opponent. In the fifth edition of this highly popular paperback, his highly popular paperback, The Insiders, Architect of the New World Order, he provides conclusive evidence that the past five administrations have been dominated by promoters of sovereignty destroying world government. His clearly written and spoken words help many Americans understand and combat our national self-defeating policies. You're in for quite a treat. I'm proud to present to you the president of the John Birch Society, Mr. John McManus. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thanks for uh, hitting the button here and getting the first slide on the uh, screen ahead of time. <laughs> I heard a story recently about a, an older couple that went out for dinner and when they got to the restaurant and they got seated, the waiter came over and uh, said, uh, what can I get you folks? And the lady piped up and she said, I'll have the, I'll have the roast beef dinner and, uh, and a salad. And the way <coughs> And the waiter said to her, and your vegetable? And she said, he'll have the same. <laughs> I found out that the ladies like that much more than the men. <laughs> well, we have a lot of ground to cover here today, so I'm not going to fool around too much. I just want to move ahead. I do want to add to what Mike said, though, uh, about presidential politics. Uh, my attitude about it, I usually say, we're not going to steal the presidency, right? And if I leave it at that, then there's hardly any hope for some people. But there is a lot of hope, and the hope resides in the House of Representatives. Uh, the Constitution says all bills for raising revenue must originate in the House. So if the House doesn't originate a bill for this or this or that or that, that's it. The power of the purse is in the house, and that's where we begin to take our country back. Uh, we're not going to steal the presidency, right? And I told that to Ron Paul face to face, and he didn't disagree. But he did a lot of good in uh, running for president, which lady did. Okay, we move ahead. We're talking about the United Nations here. And these are the commonly held attitudes. This has been up for a while, so I won't spend much time on it. There are people who say, oh, the United Nations is just a place for blowing off steam and it never accomplishes anything and it, it just needs to be reformed and, and we've got to get better leaders for it and so forth. But they do feed hungry people. Right? And of course, uh, when, they, when they say that, the response is, yeah, every bit of the money that goes to feed the hungry people goes to governments first and they keep most of it and then they feed a few people and take a few pictures. Right? That's always been the case, right? And then they say it's a place to talk rather than fight. Okay, let's, let's, this is the most repeated attitude. The UN is a place to talk rather than fight. 
Okay. Why involve 193 UN member nations when a problem affects only a few? And that's what you do if you bring it to the United Nations. Okay. Doesn't the U.S. have an ambassador in almost every other nation? So if we have a problem with some other nation, our ambassador get together with their ambassador, either our country or their country, and try to solve the problem. Why bring it to 191 others, which would make it only worse, and certainly invite there being a world conflict. So, so that doesn't hold up either. In fact, there are none of these arguments that hold up when you get down to it. Now, about the United Nations never accomplishing anything, let's take a look at some buildings here. This is United Nations headquarters in New York City, the land donated by the Rockefellers. And that's a pretty big building. And if they're doing nothing, what are all the people in that building doing? They're not doing nothing. They're doing something. And here's the International Monetary Fund of the United Nations in Washington. And that's a pretty good sized building too, full of people doing something. And here's the International Labor Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. And they're doing something. Right? And here's the World Health Organization in Geneva. That's a pretty good sized building full of people doing something. Right? And here's the International Criminal Court in The Hague in the Netherlands. And they're doing something there too. And then we have the World Bank back in Washington, D.C. That's the United Nations operation. And that's a pretty good sized building as well. So if the United Nations is a do-nothing organization, what are all these people doing? And the answer is they're not doing nothing. And we can go on. I don't have pictures for the Food and Agriculture Building of the UN that's in Rome, or the World Health Organization in Geneva, or the Seabed Authority in Jamaica, or the Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, or the Maritime Organization in London. And I don't have pictures of more agencies and organizations in Tokyo, and Bangkok, and Montreal, and Paris, and Nairobi. They're all over the world with their buildings and their people who are not doing nothing. Now let's go back to very basic here about our own country. It started with the Declaration of Independence. Men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and to secure these rights, governments are instituted. That's the fundamental philosophy of the United States of America in two very short portions of the Declaration of Independence. Then they said, Congress shall make no law regarding the rights that we got from God Almighty. That's the first uh, item in the Bill of Rights. Well, go to the UN, what do we see? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They list all of the rights that you and I want and expect to have because they came from God, but then they say, they don't first, first of all, they don't recognize God, and then they say everyone shall be subject only to such limitations as are determined by law. We say Congress shall make no law. They say they can make a law to cancel any of the rights that we expect to have. And then in 1966, the UN came out with another document called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And they said the same thing. <clears throat> rights may be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as are provided by law and are necessary. So, just like the Constitution of the Soviet Union, which said the same thing. If you go to that Constitution, I have a copy of it from 1955, you see that you have this right, and you have this right, you have all the rights that you'd want, and then they say, except if we pass a law, just like the UN. Just like the UN. So we've got polar opposites here. United States, there's God. United Nations, no God. United States, rights come from God. United Nations, rights come from government. United States, no law to suspend the rights. United Nations law at whim. Now we should we could stop right here and say we have no business being in the United Nations. Never did and never will. Right? But we'll move on. We'll move on to a man that I call the godfather of the United Nations. His name was Edward Mandel House. He was President Wilson's chief advisor. He was a Texan. He he went <coughs> he he was responsible 
uh, involved heavily in electing four consecutive governors of your state of Texas, right? This is back in the late 1800s. And then he set his sights a little higher. He said, well, I've been good at political manipulation. I'm going to shoot for the presidency. So he moved himself to New York City and he started befriending a man who at the time was the governor of New Jersey, a man named Woodrow Wilson. And in 1913, Edward Mandel House wrote a book called Philip Drew Administrator. And in it, he told what he wanted to see happen. Well, what was it that he wanted to see happen? Well, first of all, the book has a dedicatory quote from Giuseppe Mazzini. And if you're a conspiratorial history, uh, his, history buff, you would know that Mazzini was the successor of Adam Weishaupt and led the conspiracy in the middle part of Europe all during the early 1800s. House became the advisor to Wilson and then to FDR as well. And there the two of them are, Wilson and House. Wilson with the top hat on, House with the fedora. He said in his book that he was working for socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. I call him a Marxist. Right? For that reason, that's enough. He despised the U.S. Constitution. He advocated the income tax and the Federal Reserve. And he proposed world government. And then when world government suffered a blow in 1919 when the U.S. Senate said no, we weren't going to get involved in it, then he and others launched the Council on Foreign Relations. We'll talk a little bit about that as we proceed. So House was the godfather of the United Nations. He didn't get what he wanted in 1919. The Senate said no, but in 1945, the Senate said yes. House had already passed on, but uh, he, he got what he wanted. Now, in 1919, the U.S. Senate was asked to ratify our entry into the League of Nations. And they debated the matter for nine months, and they said no. We'll see later that they debated in 1945, and they debated for six days and said yes. So nine months, no, six days, yes. What happened? What's the difference? Well, the difference is Council on Foreign Relations and its influence. And if you want to know who and why and what to do about it, this is the book. I've written five books, as was mentioned by Bill. But if anybody says to me, well, what's the best book I can read to find out what's really happening to my country, I'll tell them this one. Go get the shadows of power and read about the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, in 1941, we had the crisis. And as Ron Emanuel, now mayor of Chicago, once said, the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And it's also true that if we don't have a crisis to waste, we'll create one. Well, they didn't have to create one. Here, the Japanese helped out. So on December 7th of 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked, and the crisis was there. And so immediately, some diplomats within our own country started working on forming the United Nations. Now, if you're old enough, as I am, to remember that period, you would know that everybody, after Pearl Harbor, they began to think about, well, what am I going to do to help my country win this war? We're going to be involved in war. And, and uh, th there was no doubt about that. But here we had diplomats of our country down in Washington with some people from other countries. Within 30 days of Pearl Harbor, they got together and they started working on building the United Nations. One month after Pearl Harbor, they formally had the Declaration of the United Nations. In 1943, the U.S., the U.K., USSR, and China agreed to form a world government. See, they were working all during the war. Well, people are dying and, and families are being upset and so on. These guys are working on building the United Nations. 1944, there was the famous Dumbarton Oaks Conference. Dumbarton Oaks is an estate in Washington, D.C., and there are conferences that are held there every once in a while. And they created the initial draft of the United Nations Charter in 1944. In 1945, the San Francisco Conference, delegates of 50 nations met in San Francisco, and they met for almost two months. They produced the final U.N. Charter. It was then brought to Washington for the Senate to consider and to vote on. Now, the war in Europe ended in May of 
1945, and there's the headline in the paper, VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, and Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945, but we were already in the UN. Founding of the United Nations occurred between May and July of 1945. That was the San Francisco Conference. In the U.S. delegation, there were 16 secret communists, and there were 43 members of the Council on Foreign Relations. If there were any really true good Americans among that contingent that we sent out there, I don't know who they were. Among the Council on Foreign Relations members there were a man named Nelson Rockefeller and so many others. But chief amongst them all was a man named Alger Hiss. He was the Secretary General of the founding conference and he was later found out to have been a secret communist alone. Chief authors of the UN Charter were Andrei Vyshinsky of the Soviet Union, an open communist, and Alger Hiss of the United States, a secret communist. In 1945, the Senate vote to join the United Nations, they debated for a mere six days. Remember that in 1919, it took nine months to say no, and here in six days they said yes, and the vote was 89 to two. And I'm sure everybody in the room knows who the two were. You've all heard of Senator Langer from North Dakota and, and Senator uh, Shipstead from Minnesota, haven't you? No, no, hardly anybody has ever heard of those two. Why did they vote against it? Here's Shipstead from Minnesota. He said control of the war power must remain in Congress. He saw that in the United Nations Charter we would lose it. Senator William Langer of North Dakota said the UN would have the authority to send our boys all over the earth. Right? And that's just one sentence out of each of their speeches. I went and dug them out of the congressional record. The speeches really are wonderful to read. It's nice to know that there were some people who figured it out. They had read the charter. A lot of senators, I'm sure, like today, didn't read what they were signing on. They just took direction from the leader of the party or the leader of what. Here's a diplomat named J. Reuben Clark. He'd been in the ambassadorial corps. He had been in the State Department. He read the charter and he said it's a war document, not a peace document. It makes it practically certain we shall have future wars. It removes from us the power to declare wars, to choose which side to be on, to determine the equipment we use, and to command our sons who do the fighting. And all of that has happened. And he saw it. He fought to try to get the Senate to <coughs> say no, but he, he didn't he didn't succeed. So let's take a look at the Charter. All right, you know, Charter of the United Nations. Article one, the word peace appears six times, and so the UN is, insists it's a peace organization. And you'll hear that from people. But Article two authorizes war. Article two says, it discusses the application of enforcement measures under chapter seven of the UN Charter. So you go to chapter seven and see what kind of enforcement measures they might use. Well, it says demonstrations, blockade, and other operations by air, sea, or land forces of the United Nations. This is the peace organization. That, ladies and gentlemen, is war. Now, if you're a U.S. Senator and you're asked to sign on to the United Nations Charter, you read through it, you get to Article 25, and I want you to think to yourself now, you're a U.S. Senator, you read this, would you sign the U.N. Charter if you read this? The members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. Would you sign that? 89 Senators did. Does that trump the Constitution? Of course. 89 Senators said okay. Now why? Why would that have happened? Well, as I said, I'm old enough to remember that. And I remember my own dad, who was a very patriotic American. He had the same attitude that a lot of other people had that had been inculcated into the uh, American public by the media, by politicians and so forth. And the, the attitude was, we gotta do something new. We gotta do something different. We had World War I, now we had World War II. We don't want World War III, so we gotta try something new. And that's what swayed a lot of people to support the idea of a United Nations. 
some of whom regretted it. Right? Article 25, all by itself, is enough reason to say, no, thank you. I don't want anything to do with this organization. So if Article 25 said, the United Nations accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council, how are they going to do it? Well, the source of the US, UN's military forces is Article 43. All members of the United Nations undertake to make available to the Security Council armed forces, assistance, and facilities, including the rights of passage necessary for the purpose of maintaining international peace. So all nations, by virtue of membership in the UN, agree to supply armed forces, assistance, facilities, and so on. Right? Whenever the UN decides that the UN should send troops here or there, who supplies most of the troops? The United States. Here's Colin Powell when he was Secretary of uh, State. He said, with respect to U.S. policy, when it comes to our role as a member of the Security Council, we obviously are bound by U.N. resolutions. Bound by U.N. resolutions? He should have been fired on the spot. Didn't happen. Here's George H.W. Bush. It is the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter to which the American people henceforth pledge their allegiance. Well, not all the American people, Mr. Bush. Not all. <clears throat> sacred principles of the United Nations. Is that a little over the top? A little, little bit over the top? Yeah, just, just a little bit. Now, there's something else that hardly any Americans have ever heard about, and that's the United Nations Participation Act. It is so key to understanding what's happened to our country here. It was passed by Congress in December of 1945. That's six months after we got into the United Nations. And the United Nations Participation Act says, the President shall not be deemed to require the authorization of Congress to send troops to enforce Security Council resolutions. Okay? That's treachery right there. Now there were some congressmen and one congresswoman very opposed to this. Jesse Sumner of Illinois, she said, this measure gives congressional authority for surrendering the American people to an all-powerful world government. Good for you, Jesse Sumner. She was a lawyer, she was a real estate dealer, and she <coughs> saw, it, saw it for what it was. Over in Ohio, there was a medical doctor who was in Congress named Frederick Smith. He said, this measure strikes at the very heart of the Constitution. It provides that the power to declare war shall be taken from Congress and given to the President. Here is the essence of dictatorship. Absolutely. Right on target. Uh, so they voted in the House of Representatives. Are we going to pass this United Nations Participation Act? And the vote was 344 to 15. Only 15? And the Senate approved it by voice vote. <clears throat> now, there is a bill, and I'll mention this before we finish, there is a bill in the House right now to get us out of the United Nations. Okay? It was introduced for years by Ron Paul, and now it's been introduced by Congressman Paul Brown from Georgia. The first item in that bill is to repeal the United Nations Participation Act. The very first item. And I know that hardly anybody has ever even heard of this. Right? It is so key. It is why we don't declare war when we go to war anymore. Precisely. Senator Robert Taft voted for the UN in August, in July of 1945, and regretted it later. He said the UN has become a trap, let's go it alone. He said that in 1948. He tried very hard to stop the United States emerging itself more and more into the United Nations. Now go back to the Charter and we go to Articles 52, 3, and 4. And we see regional arrangements. The UN Charter allows the formation of regional arrangements like NATO, like CETO. The Security Council shall utilize such regional arrangements for enforcement action under its authority. Security Council shall be kept fully informed of the activities of all of these regional arrangements. 
Let's talk about NATO first. NATO was sold to the American people as a way to keep the Soviet Union from moving further west after they had conquered Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, on and on they go. Right? And uh, we, it, it was sold to the American people. We've got to have NATO to stop the Soviet Union. No. No, NATO was an essential measure for strengthening the United Nations, according to its chief promoter, Secretary of State Dean Acheson a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. No surprise there. NATO was created in 1949. It derives its authority to exist from the United Nations Charter. I got this NATO handbook. It's about that thick. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. it mentions the United Nations over and over and over again, subservient to the United Nations. And only 13 senators voted no for us to get involved in NATO, led those 13 by Robert Taft. <clears throat> NATO, now with 28 member nations, is now in charge of the war in Afghanistan. Any suggestion that that might be why we're not doing so well? The Korean War started in June of 1950. That's a year after NATO was formed. North Korea invaded South Korea. The U.S. Security Council said all members send forces. The U.S. supplied the troops. There were a couple of here, a couple of there from other nations, almost all United States, and there was no declaration of war. Well, there were some reporters that went to President Truman at the time and said, how can we go to war without a declaration of war? And Truman said, we're not at war. This is a police action. If I can send troops to NATO, he said, I can send troops to Korea. There you go. There you go. During the Korean War, UN flags were flying over our troops. And General Douglas MacArthur, whom I revere, asked for more flags to send over so they could fly them over our troops. And then pretty soon he began to realize what was happening. And I know some Korean War vets who told us they figured out what was happening. They started taking those flags down. But you know, the state of war in Korea still exists. The shooting stopped. There was an armistice in 1953, but the war has never ended. The state of war still exists. We still have 40,000 troops in South Korea. We're defending South Korea while they're selling automobiles to us here in the United States. Have we lost our minds? <clears throat> Why don't they defend themselves? <clears throat> well, I think that we can't pull out of Korea because the United Nations still wants us there. Right. Korean War of police action? How many tens of thousands of Americans died there? And General George Stratemeyer, who led our troops, testified at Senate hearings after the armistice of 53. And he said, you get into war to win it, you do not get into war to stand still and lose it. And we were required to lose it. We were not permitted to win. And he went on and on. And several other generals and admirals <coughs> went to those hearings as well to protest what had been done. General Douglas McCarthy, you may recall, <coughs> liberated both South Korea from the communists and North Korea. The whole peninsula was now free. The Chinese communists came across and greatly outnumbered our people, 20 to 1. And there was some heroic activity there. One of my heroes, a general, uh, he was only a colonel then, Chesty Puller. Right. Mm -hmm. Chesty Puller at one point says to his troops, he said, we're surrounded. That means you can shoot in any direction. <laughs> <laughs> and he also said, don't let one of them get away. <clears throat> but look what MacArthur said. In his own book, Reminiscences, published years later, he quoted the Chinese general who led those forces into South Korea Lin Piao. And Lin Piao said this, I would never have made the attack and risked my men and military reputation if I had not been assured that Washington would restrain General MacArthur. They not only restrained General MacArthur, they fired him. He came back, there were ticket tape parades in the United States, one huge parade in New York City. MacArthur probably could have run for president, but he just didn't want to do it. He just said, I'm not a politician. All right, but 
<clears throat> if, if P, Lin Piao said, if I had not been assured that Washington would restrain General McCarthy, who assured him? Yeah. The United Nations yeah. and some of our own State Department people, no doubt about it. Well, NATO was already working now and working well, so let's have a duplicate. <clears throat> we'll have a duplicate of NATO and we call it the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO. Created in 1954 by John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State at the time. John Foster Dulles happened to be one of Edward Mandel House's disciples who helped to form the Council on Foreign Relations. Dulles with his brother, Alan Dulles, who was at the time the head of the CIA, uh, we were in good hands. Yeah. <laughs> now, CETO was cited as authorization to place the United States troops in Vietnam. Here's President Lyndon Johnson, 1967. During the height of the war in, in South Vietnam, he said, we're in Vietnam because the United States and our allies are committed by the CETO Treaty to act to meet the common danger of aggression in Southeast Asia. Well. The UN had passed a resolution, the United States sent the troops, and the UN controlled what was going on. In Vietnam, there were rules of engagement, and we didn't really get these copies, and we knew that something like this existed. But in 1985, Barry Goldwater, who was a senator from Arizona at the time, he published the rules of engagement in the congressional record, 17 pages of it that I copied and it goes on and on and on. It just makes you sick to your stomach to read it. Don't attack enemy planes on the ground. You can wait till they get in the air and they're shooting at you and then you can attack them. Right? Don't attack truck convoys if they go off the highway. If they go off the highway, then you couldn't touch them. Right? Don't close Haiphong Harbor, which is where, uh, that's in the North Vietnamese, got all their supplies from, from Eastern Europe and so on. Goldwater said these rules unquestionably Denied a military victory. Absolutely. Who wrote the rules of engagement? Well, some of our people did and some of the UN people, obviously. But we were not permitted to win. The Vietnam War turned out to be the only war the United States had ever lost. We move on to the first Iraq War, 1991. Saddam Hussein and his forces invaded, wanted to take over Kuwait, neighboring Kuwait. And George H.W. Bush was President of the United States, he went bonkers. He kept talking about a new world order, a new world order, a new world order, the United Nations, and every, every, he said the Gulf crisis has to do with a new world order, and that world order is only going to be enhanced if this newly activated peacekeeping function of the UN proves to be effective. You recall that the first Iraq war, it was over in a matter of weeks. It stopped suddenly. Many wondered why. Right. UN Security Council authorized forcing Iraq out of Kuwait only. That's only what they were allowed to do. And George Bush kept saying that the Iraq war is to strengthen the United Nations. Second Iraq war, 2003. This is right, uh, it's actually two years after, or a year and a half anyhow, after the 911 terrorism attack. Here's a copy of a letter written by our ambassador to the UN, John Negroponte. And it starts off by saying the actions being taken are authorized by existing council resolutions, including resolutions 678, 687, and so on and so on. There's no doubt about this. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a principle involved here. And it's not a happy thing to say that one seeks authorization from a superior from an inferior. We seek authorization from the United Nations to go to war. And they are the superior. Incredible. The Afghan war now, it's under NATO. We have a 13 plus years of war. We're still sustaining casualties and on and on it goes. There's General David Petraeus, who happened to be a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Surprise, surprise. And he disgraced himself, and then I don't think we'll hear from him anymore. Now let's just summarize UN wars. The Korean War, the UN flags were flying. 
The Vietnam War was under SECO. The Desert Storm War under UN authorization. Second Iraq War, UN authorization. The Afghan War under NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, our military has been a UN puppy dog since 1945. And I say that having served in the Marine Corps during the 1950s. I didn't know. Just before the second Iraq war, <clears throat> six months in fact, the House International Relations Committee met. Congressman Ron Paul, a member of the committee. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Okay, Ron, what's your motion? I move that we declare war on Iraq. And I intend to vote against my regiment because I don't believe we should go to war against Iraq. <laughs> but I also don't think we should ignore the constitutional requirement for a congressional declaration. Good for you, Ron Paul. Well, the chairman of the House International Relations Committee is a supposedly great conservative from the Chicago area named Henry Hyde. And Henry Hyde actually said to Ron Paul, Ron, there are things in the Constitution that have been overtaken by events and by time. Declaration of war is one of them. Your measure is inappropriate and anachronistic. It isn't done anymore. And that was the end of that. Some of my Birch friends in the Chicago area, where Hyde was from, they wrote to him and they said, is the part that says you shall receive compensation for your services and also an <laughs> <laughs> They didn't get an answer. In 1961, our State Department, under CFR member Dean Rusk, put out State Department document 7277, called for gradual turnover of military to the UN disarm the citizen. It says at the end in stage three, disarmament would proceed to the point where no state or person would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN Peace Force. That is still policy of the United States. 1962, they commissioned another CFR member named Lincoln P. Broomfield to write a pamphlet, a book, of a, well, it's a booklet-sized thing, it's about 30 pages, a world effectively controlled by the United Nations. Calls for total disarmament of civilians. Said membership in the new regime, far from being a privilege, would be mandatory. They mean business. <clears throat> they want to disarm the citizenry. So we had the UN Arms Trade Treaty, which the US Senate said no. Thank God. There are people who say, oh, there's no hope. Well, there's some hope there. There's a lot of hope in a lot of different places. <laughs> now notice at the bottom right of this, there's a picture of a, a, a monument of sorts outside UN headquarters in, in New York City, in the courtyard, leading up to the front door. And it's a pistol with its barrel tied in a knot to indicate the attitude of the UN towards private ownership of weapons. What's interesting about that is that that is not a military weapon. That is a Colt revolver. And that means civilians, right? Now, that was given to the UN by Luxembourg. And Luxembourg was one of the countries that had gun control and gun registration. And when Hitler moved into Luxembourg, all he did was go down to City Hall, pick up the lists, and go collect the weapons. But those people are stupid enough to have presented the United Nations with a a pistol, a pistol with its barrel tied in a knot. Incredible. Here's a headline that appeared in our New American magazine. I, I love to say, gun control Mrs. Mark. Senator Feinstein shoots off mouth his foot. <laughs> the, United, the UN Charter also has in Article 2, Paragraph 7, it states very clearly that nothing in the present charter shall authorize the UN to intervene in matters which are essentially within the jurisdiction of any state. So if you have something going on in your country, it's none of the business of the UN according to the charter. Do they violate that? Of course. Do they ever? All right. Here's an uh, organizational chart from the United Nations. I got that by going to UN headquarters and they were passing them out. So I said, well, can I have a couple? I got a pile of them. I started giving them to my colleagues. You can't read it, I know you can't, 
But let me tell you that it has UN involvement in education, population, children, women, environment, trade, finance, health, agriculture, labor, military, science, culture, atomic power, telecommunications, aviation, industrial development, narcotics, refugees, property rights. It's all right on that single organizational chart. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what all of those people in all of those buildings are doing. That's it. Is the unit and intervening? Well, they intervened in Katanga, a province of the Belgian Congo, the former Belgian Congo, in 1961. And they bombed hospitals and they bombed uh, uh, schools, they bombed civilians, because a breakaway part of that, called Katanga, had decided to separate themselves from a communist-led government that had taken over the Belgian Congo, the former Belgian Congo. The, Un the United Nations actually did that, bombed hospitals, bombed schools, bombed civilians. And the 46 doctors of the Elizabethville Hospital put together a book called 46 Angry Men. They hurriedly put it together with pictures and they sent a copy to every leader of Europe's nations. They sent it to President Kennedy. They sent a copy to the Pope. They sent it wherever they could. We got copies of it, made many, distributed them around just to show what the United Nations was all about. The United Nations then did the same thing under NATO in Libya. On hospitals, on civilians, and so forth. And we have a couple here who experienced that by living in Libya at the time. In Rhodesia, they destroyed a nation. And they made it into Zimbabwe. And if you know anything about Zimbabwe, it's a classic case of <coughs> inflation, where you have currency printed that they had to rubber stamp it and they had another three zeros just to make it seem like it was worth something. In Australia, the United Nations stopped a hydroelectric power plant in the name of environmentalism. Intervening within the jurisdiction of them? Yeah, yeah. In Guatemala, they demanded that they change the constitution to allow abortion. The European Union has destroyed the sovereignty of 28 nations, and it's all UN. You could go to their own documents and find out it's UN, it's UN, it's UN. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, both UN agencies going around the world, financing the wrong people, financing the wrong projects, taking money from you and me to do it. Are they intervening in the United States? Yeah, they have spoken out. They don't want us to have any laws whatsoever against abortion. They've, they've interfered, keeping a mine from developing in uh, Montana. They don't like the fact that we have capital punishment. They don't like our border control, and neither do I, because it's not tough enough. <laughs> they have judicial decisions being handed down by UN agencies that supersede our, our laws, the Supreme Court, the state courts, and they are intervening, wanting us to give up the right to be armed. You, intervening in the United States, look what this California retired Supreme Court justice says. He says, someday it will be malpractice for lawyers to fail to include UN human rights law in their cases. Right. That's the way we're heading. Right. Massive intervening, how about Agenda 21? Agenda 21 is a book of over a thousand pages, all kinds of details in there about how they're going to take control of the United States. The forward to that book, written by an editor, a lawyer named C. Tars, he said, Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on earth. Effective execution will require a profound reorientation of all human society unlike anything the world has ever experienced. Intervening within our country. Agenda 21 is a stealth program. Right? It's after property rights, it's after family size, water rights, civil liberties, waste disposal. It wants to control food, transportation, energy, education, children. It's massive and it's very dangerous. 
Happily, there have been many communities alerted by the John Birch Society members across the country that had gotten involved in this and are now pulling out. We have a DVD and booklets on the subject of Agenda 21. Then we go into Common Core, <clears throat> Globalism for Your Children. Let me, let me narrow it very uh, succinctly and say that Common Core is to make a drone workforce for the new world order. Amen. Not to have people become uh, educated, not to have them understand the classics in history, not to understand uh, uh, science or anything. It's to make drones to supply goods for the new world order. That's what Common Core really boils down to. Arne Duncan, Secretary of Education in 2010. Our goal for the coming year will be to work closely with global partners, including UNESCO, to promote qualitative improvement and system strengthening. Is Common Core a UN program? Yes. Agenda 21 a UN program? Yes. Here's our DVD on Common Core. I recommend that. So we see the schools now, they've replaced reading, writing, and arithmetic with recycling, Racism and reproduction. We have a new three R's. Future plans for the United Nations. I think you've probably heard of Jacques Cousteau, a nice little man going around the world worrying about the oceans. <coughs> Turns out he's a savage. He actually wrote in a UN publication in Paris, it's terrible to have to say this. World population must be stabilized. And to do that, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. To go from near 7 billion down to 1 billion, and maybe even fewer. Well, Jacques Cousteau has done his part for that program. He is now deceased. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the key is to get us out of the United Nations. There's Robert Welsh. I bless him, he died in 1985. He said, withdraw the United States from the United Nations and you have broken the back of the world conspiracy. Now I know there are a lot of people that want to get involved in Common Core, and they want to get involved in the Agenda 21, and they want to get involved in our, what, what's being done to our military, and they like the idea of keeping and, and bearing arms, so they like all these other things and everything else. But ladies and gentlemen, it's all UN. UN is the big problem. Casting a shadow over all of our rights. And it's a conspiracy. A uh, great man, I should have put his name up there. His name is James Lucier, L U C I E R. He said one time the first job of conspiracy is to convince the world that conspiracy does not exist. That's brilliant. It's absolutely true. And if you go around and you start talking to some people you know, and all of a sudden they'll say, oh, you sound like a conspiracy theorist, right? right? And you say, no, no, I'm not. I'm a conspiracy factist. <laughs> Keep that in mind. That's the way to respond to those people. But they've got all kinds of people debunking the idea of conspiracy. Right? Conspiracy surely does exist. And Robert Welch said that there's a conspiracy at work as sure as there is a law of gravity. That's a pretty good summation. All right, let's talk about American leaders. Now, are they stupid bunglers? Not really. <laughs> not really. Are they not lacking in good information, which is why they do some of the things they do? Again, not really. Well then, what's going on here? America's leaders know what they're doing and what it leads to, and ergo, therefore, conspiracy. Okay, let's make some conclusions. Now this first conclusion I'm giving you here is something that I want you to remember and don't ever forget it. The United Nations is not taking over our country. Our country is being delivered to the United Nations. Amen. That puts a whole different spin on it. Right? The UN would be powerless without the United Nations, the United States. We're being delivered. All right, conclusion number two. 
membership in the UN is completely incompatible with an independent US and freedom for the American people. No doubt about it. Okay, conclusion number three. Should we reform it? You don't reform cancer. You cut it out. Should we reduce our payments? Well, that would be a good idea down to none, right? And then maybe they'd throw us out. But that's not really the answer either. How about, let's get a friendlier Secretary General. <coughs> what would that solve? Nothing. So what is the real conclusion? Get, out. get us out of the United Nations. That's a billboard. It's down in Arizona. I don't know if it's still up. It was there last time it was down there. Halfway between Tucson and Phoenix. And I knew it was there. And when I'm being driven by a good Birch friend, I said, well, when we get to the uh, billboard, please stop. I want to take a picture. And I said, I might even get out and genuflect. I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if those were all over the country? Yes. Billboards like that. Something maybe you should shoot for amongst this group. Put up a UN billboard. Let people know that the John Birch Society is not only still around, but thriving. There's House Resolution 75. I already mentioned it. It's called the American Sovereignty Restoration Act. It's a measure to provide for complete withdrawal of the US from the United Nations. There's Paul Brown. He's a medical doctor. He's a congressman from Georgia. He's now trying to be a senator. I wish he'd stay in the House. I think the House is more important than the Senate. But anyhow, that's up to him. Anyhow, his bill is exactly the same bill that Ron Paul put in the ACA for many years. And item one is to repeal the United Nations participation. So what about this John Birch Society? Rock solid information, five decades of experience, Sorely needed national organization. Plan for victory. Let's go back to that national organization. What, what, what's, what, that makes us different. See, when the John Birch Society decided to get involved in the fight against Agenda 21, all of a sudden things happened all over across the country. So much so that the United, uh, the, United <laughs> the New York Times ran a front page article on a Sunday edition blaming the John Birch Society for the attention being drawn to Agenda 21. Yeah, I got to go two more minutes. What's our plan? Inform ourselves, understand the enemy, educate and activate friends, grow membership in your district, train leaders, change the voting record, or change the congressman. Restore constitutional government, maintain vigilance. There's the booklet that was mentioned. I think we have them on the book table. It's, it's my uh, information that I've given you here in the talk, plus a lot more. So those commonly held attitudes are wrong. They're all wrong. The choice is ours. Less government or world governments. U.S. Constitution or U.N. Charter. God or no God. The choice is ours. A better world or a new world order? To achieve victory, we need more members in the Birch Society. Robert Welch always said, come join us in our proud companionship and in our epic undertaking, and that's exactly my point of view. If you're a member, good for you. Thank you. Keep at it. We are gaining. Right? It might not seem to it like, like it some days, but we are gaining. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much.